You all want to know the amazing community you have created here in the lake of Chapala. And as they were saying, I'm going to talk about um, the progress we've made in Jalisco towards the LGBT uh, rights. I'm sexual diversity director for the state government. That means that uh, right now at the Jalisco state government, there's an undersecretary for human rights, which has a direction for each group of population that we consider priorities. So we have a direction for youth, we have a direction for people with disabilities, we have a direction for um, migrant inclusion, we have um, the Indigenous Communities Commission, and recently we created the Sexual Diversity Director. I say recently, but it's been already almost five years since I've been appointed uh, to this position, and this was the first position in the whole country uh, that was created within a local government to promote public policy for LGBT inclusion. And right now, after Jalisco has made this, um, this position, there's other states or other cities around the country that have started uh, emulating what we've been doing here in Jalisco. But uh, five years ago, when, when this was created, well, there were no references on how this should be made. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through a little bit through the history of uh, our own local movement. But you know, five years ago, when the government said, okay, we're gonna open an office and we're gonna start uh, becoming an ally of this uh, agenda, it was kind of weird that being said from the institution that from, for a long time was the principal promoter of discrimination. You know, for a long time, we had um, conservative uh, governments that were against our rights. And for a long time, I'll go through the details in the history, Many of the hate speech or many of the of the um, people being against our rights came from the, the state government. So we had to face that uh, task from the beginning. We, 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 we needed, or I consider this office should acknowledge that history. We could just not uh, pretend that didn't happen. We had to acknowledge that in order to create uh, trust bound within the local organizations that could, you know, give us a path to have uh, an, an agenda. So, uh, you know, five years ago when I, when I was appointed sexual diversity director, people would always say like, but Jalisco is a very conservative state, like how are you going to do anything in that state that's very conservative? And I always said like, you know, people that live in Jalisco are not necessarily as conservative as the government has made us believe. You know, for a long time, there was this uh, conservative speech uh, promoted from the power that made people believe we all uh, think the same way they did. And that wasn't necessarily the truth. So that, you know, the political context in the state had been changing uh, and the, on, the, on the recent years. And now, five years after we've been taking a, an affirmative public policy, now Jalisco is being considered as one of the most progressive states in Latin America. For example, this year, uh, the New York Times uh, appointed Guadalajara as one of the 52 cities to visit in 2023, and they did it acknowledging all the advances we've had on uh, queer culture. You know, we're gonna be we're going to have the gay games uh, on November this year, and I'll tell you a little bit more of what this means in our history, you know, open, opening our doors to this international event. But not only the New York Times Magazine did this uh, on January, there's other uh, magazines like uh, Travel Plus Leisure Magazine in the United States gave us the Tra Trailblazer Award because of the work we've done towards LGBT inclusion, and also the Time Magazine uh, appointed Jalisco as one of the great places to be, acknowledging the work we've done in, in human rights. And this is not something I tell you to say like, oh, look how great we are. It's something, it's, it's just the proof that when there's you know, solid volunteer, when there's solid work, we can achieve human rights milestones in a short period of time. You know, five years ago, it was unthinkable for a state like Jalisco to have the rights we've been ensuring in the past uh, time. And people would, you know, that, that could um, take your faith away saying like, no, probably this thing will never happen, you know? But the work we've done in five years give us the, 
the, the, the, the scope that this is possible when a lot of volunteers are uh, put together. Just to go through a little bit of the local history, because I think, um, well, I'm, I'm a passionate about history, that's on the personal side, but on a political spectrum, I think it's very important to always acknowledge these things. And right now, you know, um, youth, when they, they want to know about LGBT history, they go on the internet, and they might read a lot of, about Stonewall which is very important, but it's not what happened locally. And there's no necessarily many resources to learn about the local history. No? You can see what happened in Stonewall, or you can see what happened in, in the UK, or you can see what happened in other places, but we don't necessarily have uh, a lot of places where we could learn about the local history. So we've made a lot of efforts to um, archive, to document, and to socialize the history of the local movement. So, in Jalisco, the, the civil rights movement towards the LGBT rights recognition started or started to be very visible in 1981. We know, as, as, happened, as it happened in the United States, back in the day there was, there was a policy of repression. You know, there was police brutality against uh, LGBT people. And uh, in Mexico, during the 70s, there, it, there was a political context where there started to be a lot of social movements. And you know, back in the day, we were governed by a regime that had only one party. It was like a kind of a very uh, strict uh, regime that was not very democratic. So in the 70s, a lot of people started to have different social movements towards the democratization of the country. And that made that the, um, the response of the authorities became way more tough. And when things get tough, they always get tougher to the population that, that was already on a, on a complicated spectrum. So when, when this repression started to, to get tougher in the late 70s and early 80s, uh, LGBT population was one of the first targets of the police brutality. So in the 80s, in, in Guadalajara, those of you who, who've been to Guadalajara, in downtown Guadalajara, there's a park that's very important for the, the political movement. It's called the Revolution Park, or it's called the Red Park. And back in the day, that was a place, it was a cruising spot, it was a place where people would meet, people would gather, and police started to have a, a policy of cleaning the park from LGBT populations. You know, they started harassing people, they started detaining people just for holding hands or just for being, or just for not having the appearance of a man or a woman in the terms society would uh, define. So, you know, getting used to go to the jail to take out your friends, getting used to have, you know, like collect money to pay the bill to take out your friends, that in a way makes you organize without your volunteer. No? You're facing this harassment, you have to organize yourself. And that's how in 1981, the first local homosexual organization was created in Guadalajara. So in Mexico, the first uh, like uh, LGBT rights organization was founded in 1978 in Mexico City, and in Guadalajara it was founded in 1981. That's how um, an, an organization that was called Grupo Orgullo Homosexual de Liberación, it, 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 in English would be like, Homosexual Liberation Pride Group. That was the first organization. And it, it was an organization that was founded explicitly to make a front to the, to the police harassment. So this organization started to, to be visible. And in 1982, we had federal elections in Mexico. And those federal elections, I was telling you, we were in a context seeking for more democracy. So it was the first elections where there was a law it was a, there was a law passed that gave certain guarantees to minor, minority parties. The, it gave certain protection to candidates that came from minority parties. And a left party, in, it was called the, it was a laborist party, presented the first woman candidate to the Mexican president. She was called Rosario Barra de Piedra. Uh, she was a very well-known activist because her son was disappeared by the state in the 70s, so she became uh, very active uh, in that uh, uh, political spectrum. 
And this party said, well, since we are, you know, putting on the public agenda topics that are comfortable for the, for the government, we're going to as well open a space for six homosexual candidates. So they said we're going to have four uh, candidates, homosexual candidates for the Congress in Mexico City, one in Tijuana, because back in the day Tijuana was one of the first cities where like, LGBT activism was starting to be invisible, and one in Guadalajara. So they came to Guadalajara to see who could uh, you know, face this, um, or take this candidacy, and they found Pedro Preciado, who was the founder of this organization, and they offered him to be candidate. And he said, like, you know, I'm not necessarily thinking of having a candidacy or being a candidate, you know, I'm just like, just wanting police to stop harassing me. But since they had this new law where the, the minority candidates had certain protection, he said, well, if I'm a candidate, then I'm gonna be able to talk about homosexuality or homosexual rights in the public uh, space without being harassed by the police. So that's why he accepted to be a candidate and uh, this organization started uh, to be more visible. But during his campaign, one day, the 28th of April, uh, the 23rd of April of 1982, he was drinking coffee with some friends near this park I was telling you, and um, the, the owner of the, of the coffee shop called the police and he said like, no, I have six faggots here, take them to jail. The police came and, you know, started to harass them. And he was like, hey, you cannot detain me, I'm a candidate. And he was like, no, that's, how, how are you going to be a candidate? Uh, and they took him, he, they detained him. And when they realized the mistake they had, make it, they had made because they were, he was effectively a candidate, they took him out and uh, that in a way led them or inspired them to uh, have a first public uh, manifestation or first public march uh, demanding the stop of harassment, uh, of the police harassment. Uh, that happened on the 8th of May on 1982, and that was visible in Guadalajara. You know, in the 80s, there was, there was a, a context of um, a lot of organizations, no? So these, these first organizations started to be more visible, created their first newspaper, uh, and then by reading them, we can understand also the first reflections they were having. So we can find that in 1984, there's a, a girl, um, a lesbian, that uh, writes an article in this newspaper, that, that was like a, a community newspaper, and she, she was talking about how the voices of the lesbian woman were not taken fully in, in account within this organization. So she calls to other lesbians to uh, meet and start talking about their own problematics and their own rights, and that, you know, uh, starts developing also uh, other organization and, and it ends up in 1986 with the foundation of the first lesbian group of Guadalajara which is the Patlatonali uh, organization. So in, the, in, this, in this decade um, many people started to um, collectively organ, or organize towards the right but it's very interesting to uh, analyze what were their first public demands. And we see in the pictures of this 1982 march uh, in these days, that uh, one of the main uh, demands is lesbians and homosexuals, we're not criminals and we are not sick. The despenalization of homosexuality happened in Mexico until 1998, but the ban on conversion therapy happened in Jalisco just in 2022. So these public demands, they had to be on the public sphere for almost 40 years until the authorities uh, really took them into a public policy. And it's that, that's why I think it's, it's important to have this scope on history, not only because we need to honor what happened before, but because it gives us a lecture or it gives us perspective that, you know, having a ban on conversion therapy, it's not something new, it's not the newest um, uh, scream of fashion, no? It's something, it's, it's a historical depth the authorities have had with the LGBT population. I won't go through all the details of the history because it's fascinating and it's, it's very complex. I couldn't not uh, go through it fully in this um, conference, but I just wanted to put this historical perspective to understand 
why today uh, the government of Jalisco has been taking these steps and it's acknowledging this uh, very uh, wide context of uh, activism that's been for four, more than 40 years on the streets, on through organizations, pushing our government to take action. And that's how uh, in 2018 uh, the government of Jalisco decided to open this office uh, to have public policy towards LGBT inclusion and um, I was appointed and uh, when we started I had uh, different reflections that I wanted to no, I, 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 I decided this direction had to work with three uh, main axes. So the first one is clearly ensuring human rights. You know, Jalisco in 2018 was a state where equal marriage wasn't fully approved, even though we could get married because the Supreme Court had, uh, had ensured that right. The Congress hadn't changed our legislation. Uh, in 2018, you know, uh, uh, the trans population didn't have the legal right to identity insured. You know, in 2018, we barely had uh, any rights insured in Jalisco. The ones we had, we had them because of um, Supreme Court uh, actions and not necessarily because of decisions of the local government. So we had these main X towards ensuring human rights, and not only in these like big um, uh, agendas that were very visible, but you know our rights uh, can be um, violated in every sphere. You know? Our right to like a, to health, to education, like we can talk of any rights and. Um, try to understand how sexual orientation or gender identity becomes a, a barrier for some people to access any right. So we had to make these uh, reflections of how, uh, how to take action on many different levels to ensure that uh, sexual orientations or gender, like non-normative non sexual orientations or gender identities were not barriers to access any right. The other X we had to work on was the prevention of discrimination. At the moment, we didn't have any institution, or even though we had since 2015, the first law uh, in Jalisco that talked about, or that prohibited discrimination and explicitly talked about discrimination against LGBT population, we still didn't have institutional uh, efforts to document what's happening in order to understand the phenomenon to invest um, budget and to um, uh, ensure this didn't happen again. And the third X we had, it was, uh, we called it cultural change. Because we think or we believe that uh, it's not enough to have our rights insured on paper. It's not enough to have our rights insured by the court or by the Congress if this doesn't uh, represent a cultural change. If people on the state don't start uh, embracing LGBT rights as part of our identity. So that's why we've made a lot of efforts on trying to uh, record that, that, you know, that the whole state recognize the, the history of the LGBT movement as part of the identity of the state. You know, we are just some days away, um, the, the next week is going to be the 200th uh, birthday of Jalisco. No, Jalisco was the first independent state or the, the first federate state in Mexico. Mexico is a federation and the first federate state was Jalisco. So the 16th of June, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be marked as the 200 years of Jalisco as a free state. So in this public conversation, you know, where us uh, people of Jalisco are very proud of being a free state, we must not forget that the freedom we're facing today it's just not a freedom in terms of not being in jail. No, it's, a, it's a freedom that's been, in a way, formed by these uh, different uh, collectives, not only the LGBT population, many others, no, but these civil movements, these civil uh, fights towards equality are the, the, the gasoline that have molded Jalisco into a free state, which is right now being published no, in this like bicentenary um, celebration. So I'm just going to tell you what we've done in, in, in these three axes or, or how we've tried to start 
molding uh, um, uh, a public policy because five years ago it didn't exist, there were no references in Mexico. Today we still have um, a lot of um, things to do, but I feel in a way we've started to create a path on how the government should play a role towards ensuring our rights. So for example, uh, on 2020, the 28th of October of 2020, the governor of Jalisco signed the bill to uh, reform the, the civil registration uh, norm to uh, ensure trans people right to the legal identity. Uh, that was, of course, very important. But what, what was the most important of it is that uh, we became the first state in Latin America to ensure this right to kids and trans youth. So today in Jalisco, without age requirements, uh, trans people can go to the civil registration offices and ask for the change on their legal documents. So they can have a, a, a birth certificate uh, with their name, with their gender identity, and that's something that prevents mainly kids from discrimination, for example, in school. Something we've, we've seen is uh, the barriers or, or the, the threats to the right of education trans and kids youth face but by not having their legal documents when, when they already have their, their, their gender identity fully understood. Um, why is it important to have this right, for example, without age requirements? We'll see uh, this year the, the Mexican, it's called INEGI, it's our census, or it's our statistic uh, institution, published the first um, a statistic about LGBT population in Mexico. This gives us a lot of data, but one of the data that's very interesting is that 60% of trans people in Mexico identified their gender identity before seven years old. Mo you know, our reaffirming or uh, acknowledging our gender identity is something we all face on the first or when we're kids. Eventually, those of us who are not trans, it's a process that we don't have to acknowledge because, you know, it's not weird to anyone. So we might think we didn't have that process. But the fact is that that process wasn't very visible when I was growing up. It doesn't mean it didn't happen. Or it doesn't mean people who are not cisgender, it means they're, they're trans, didn't have this knowledge of their own identity in their first... Um, when they were very little. And I go through this data because um, this topic, you know, the trans kids and youth, it's a topic that's being very widely discussed uh, by politicians. I know you, if, if you've been following up what's uh, been happening in the United States recently, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of cruel legislation uh, seeking for, uh, you know, not only limiting trans kids' rights, but also their parents, you know, like what's the, the, the initiatives that, that are being passed in certain states where they, they seek to criminalize the parents of trans youth and kids that, you know, accompany their kids. It's something that's very, that comes from the incomprehension of these topics from the beginning. So I think that in Mexico having these data from, you know, our public statistic institution that gives us, the, gives us the understanding that the majority of trans population knows their, their gender identity from very little. It's, it's a very powerful um, information to go against the prejudice that certain people, because of certain interests, might uh, you know, spread. Uh, the last year, on 2022, we had an amazing day in Congress, the 6th of April of 2022. The Congress of Jalisco finally approved equal marriage. You know, back in the day, or just one year ago, uh, our um, legislation said that marriage was between a man and a woman. It explicitly said it that way. And now uh, that text has been changed to recognize that marriage is between two persons. Um, and also the same day, the ban on conversion therapy was approved in the Congress. So that, this is very important because it, not only now it's it's um, it's a crime on our on our norms, but um, 
it, it gives a visibility that there is nothing to heal. In Mexico, we have this slogan when we talk about conversion therapy, that one of like the main um, phrases we use is there's nothing to heal. I don't know if heal is the, is, is the correct word. There's nothing to cure uh, when we talk about gender identity. So we are one of the few uh, states where um, this ban on conversion therapy has been already uh, approved. You know, um, I'm just gonna tell you some things about my, my work. In the five years I've been in the sexual diversity direction, I've been, uh, we've liberated six people that were, um, that were being illegal, illegally uh, free, private, private from their liberty, how do you say? Deprived. Deprived from their liberty to be um, submitted to a conversion therapy. So, you know, their friends or their couples, they, 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 they came to the authority and say, hey, I know my, my, my boyfriend um, was, you know, put in this clinic by his family and we've, we've made a, like a whole protocol to, uh, you know, liberate them from these places where these um, well, torture practices are being uh, held. So I just put this on perspective because then when we talk about topics like conversion therapy, there's people that can't believe this still happens. And you know, I tell you from the first hand, it's still happening, not only in Jalisco, like in a lot of places, and that's why it's so important that you know, our institutions take these steps forward. Um, also, talking about other rights, in 2021, we had the first uh, fully uh, legally adoption by a lesbian couple. Palmira and Gabriela, they adopted um, a five-year-old kid, Ricardo, um, and that was the first time there was, there was a fully um, adoption. We, we haven't had uh, legal changes yet, you know, legislation still have, you know, as equal marriage has said, between a man and a woman, there's many other articles in our legislation that need to be changed in, in their narrative, but having them miswritten, it's not an excuse for the authorities who don't ensure their rights. So what we've done is work with the child protection institutions so they can integrate the whole adoption process without discriminating the, the family that's looking to adopt. And that's something that's mainly focused on the rights of the kids to have a family than necessarily on the, on, on the rights of the parents to have kids. It's just ensuring you know, kids can have a family without discrimination. So after Pamela and Gabriela adopted Ricardo in 2021, there's um, like 20 something families that are like homosexual or lesbian couples that are on the process of uh, the adoption. It's a, very, it's, a, it's a long process, it takes um, a lot of steps, but we've been ensuring that LGBT families can go through this process without uh, any, any barriers. And we've also been working on our right to health, for example. We just opened a new clinic in Guadalajara for uh, HIV. Uh, it, you know, in 2020, uh, when the COVID pandemic hit, that, you know, made us um, understand all the weaknesses we had in our health, uh, in our, in our health uh, system. And eventually, during the first months of the COVID pandemic, a lot of, um, you know, for example, the time for when you, when you got di diagnosed positive, the time for your first uh, meeting with a doctor started to go up because many of the doctors were on, on the front line of COVID. So that made us go um, in to reanalyze the, the public policy towards HIV and other um, health topics that we needed to address. So since 2020 to till the day, we've been innovating on how the state should address uh, HIV and well, recently uh, monkeypox. In Mexico, we don't have monkeypox vaccines. That's because the federal government didn't consider it a priority. So, um, you know, something like, like we saw uh, in the 80s when HIV was, was visible, they didn't consider uh, buying monkeypox vaccines are, as a priority for the federal government, but we on the state level did um, something that's been very successful. Uh, we hired um, 
how do you say a brigada? Like, well, a group of people to be on the street uh, giving information, prevention information of monkeypox and HIV and other uh, information that's relevant for people. So this started almost a year ago and it's been uh, going on since. And it's been very interesting to have, um, you know, LGBT, popula LGBT health professionals on streets, on the bars, on the places where LGBT population gathers, giving um, close information on how to prevent or how to uh, be aware of uh, monkeypox. So we couldn't buy the vaccines on the state level. And it's, that's something that had to be done by the federal government. But we could, uh, what we could do from the state level was, you know, habilitating a call center, you know, facilitating everything if you needed to have um, a test or if you needed to quarantine for uh, monkeypox. So. Uh, at the beginning, we had uh, some cases, but in the, in the past months, the, the cases of, of monkeypox have been uh, lowering a lot, and right now we don't have any active cases in the state. And um, other, just like going through different rights we've been trying to ensure, other rights is the, the right to public, uh, to politic participation. And for example, in the 2021 elections, we, with the electoral authority, we promote, uh, we call it like a pact or like a like an act where uh, most, not all of them, but 11 out of the 30 local political parties, they signed certain compromises towards um, LGBT participation on uh, the electoral process. And also the, the electoral authorities gave candidates the possibility to be civilized their, um, their gender identity or their sexual orientation. This didn't give them any um, any advantages, it's just something they could do freely if they, if they felt to. And we had, that, that gave us very important data, that is that in, in, the, in the Jalisco elections in 2021, we had 80 openly LGBT candidates to different levels of representation. Seven of them got uh, elected. Uh, so we started to being more visible and you know, there's a lot of people that question why visibility is important, but I do believe visibility is important and that doesn't mean LGBT people, we only talk about LGBT issues in politics. You know, we can be experts on water, we can be experts on mobility, or we can talk about anything. It's just that we, um, we bring another perspective to the table where decisions are being uh, taken. And that's why it's very important to ensure the political participation of uh, LGBT population. In 2021, we finally got to, um, to put on this uh, mechanism against uh, victims of discrimination. And uh, it's interesting because since 2021 up to today, we've, um, we've received more than 900 people in, in our office that came to have orientation. Um, out of these 900 people, 117 of them were facing a discrimination situation. So what we do in this in this area is, you know, we, we listen what they're facing and we uh, design a legal strategy for them, and we go through them with them through all the process to ensure that the areas of government of government that are responsible of putting a fine or having a sanction or taking action that they they uh, finally do. So out of these 170 people that have faced a discrimination situation that have came to our office, right now 60% of them have a resolution that they consider in their favor. So it's very important, not only because uh, we ensure that person's right, but having or documenting these discrimination practices give us a, a, a very profound understanding of the patterns. And that gives us it gives us the information to be more strategic on how to implement public policy. Just to put in a concrete example of this, you know, we do training, we do a lot of training for public servants, but then, for example, we've been receiving a lot of cases, as I was telling you, of discrimination in the school level. Well, this month, on June, we'll publish the first uh, protocol for schools on how to uh, ensure trans uh, kids and youth uh, rights in the school. 
So, uh, you know, documenting the cases, putting the patterns clearly on the table, that gives us the possibility to talk, for example, with the Ministry of Education, that you, 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 you might imagine it's not easy when there's these narratives when, you know, leave the kids alone and all the, all the things we've, we know people that are against our rights have been promoting. It's not easy to put on the table uh, a project for a protocol, for example, for schools on how to treat these, these topics. And it was possible because we have the information, because we have documented the cases. So that's why, it, that's why it's very important for us to have this mechanism, um, not only for ensuring the victim's right, but for taking that information and that data and transform it into other public policies uh, actions that we've been uh, taking. And in the third way, I, I was telling you, uh, the cultural change is something that's important for us. And in that, in that area, with example, uh, we have our, the local the public channel, Jalisco TV. In Jalisco TV, we're constantly putting information, like affirmative information, towards LGBT rights or promoting a lot of um, documentaries or films freely, taking it to different cities on the, on the state. We, um, we did the last year an exhibition at a museum about the 40 years of the LGBT uh, history, and that was like the first exercise. It was clearly limited in a way, but it was the first exercise of uh, archiving. There was two investigators, uh, Arcelia Paz, which is an amazing uh, academic, that she's been uh, documenting uh, a lot of the lesbian history of the city, and Paula Alcantar, which is another academic that has been doing the same with like the political movement. So, uh, with help of those, with those, these two academics, we, in a way, could uh, create this exhibition in a museum. That was the first time that in a public museum we were seeing um, an exhibition about LGBT history. And you know, this exhibition was open during four months. And by the end of these four months, 70,000 people went to visit the exhibition. So this talks about how it's important for us to see our history and our uh, identity represented in a, in a, in a dig dignified uh, space. So this is just one of most examples that, you know, we've, at the Sexual Diversity Direction, we've been trying to be uh, very precise on the juridic uh, strategies, but also very um, open to uh, to go through other strategies that are more social or more uh, cultural uh, in a way. And this, uh, in, it ends up, I'll be just on, on finishing my presentation to open uh, the space for some, some questions. Um, this uh, wraps up with uh, the gay games in 2023, which is very important for us to have the gay games, you know, not only because it's a huge event and brings money to the city and everyone, everyone's happy about it, but you know, back in the day, 1991, um, the, the, the lesbian group Patlatonali and other collectives, they, they, they won the right to have the ILGA annual conference in Guadalajara in 1991. And that was definitely a milestone for the, for the Mexican LGBT movement, but for, the, for, for all Latin America, because it was the first time this conference was going to be held in a Latin American country. And in that moment, the government of Guadalajara promoted a hate campaign to prevent this event from happening in Guadalajara. It was very tough, you know, they put, they put hate message in walls to the whole city, uh, the major said they were going to put up in jail everyone that came to this conference. And at the end, the conference could not be held in Guadalajara, and it had to happen in, in other city in Mexico was a, that was called Acapulco. So having 30 years later an international event like Gay Games, it's not only important for what Gay Games represent, but it, at least I believe from the authority size, it's an act of reparation for the historical damage that it was made by the authorities 30 years ago. And it's important to phrase it this way because this will only give us perspective on why it's important to have these uh, kinds of events. No, it's not just because of the money, it's not just because of the, of the international visibility, it's also because it pays off what have happened uh, before. So this is very briefly what we've been doing in Jalisco in the past five years. 
I believe we are facing one of the most open moments in Jalisco and in Mexico towards LGBT issues. And I know it's not the same in the States. I've seen, um, you know, Human Rights Campaign declare a state of emergency just a couple of days ago. And, you know, it's, 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 it's tough to see, you know, I'm, I'm very young in a way, and I grew up seeing uh, advances in the United States before that in Mexico. So it's not only sad to see our rights being threatened anywhere in the world, but it's also frightening to see that these things are fragile, that the, uh, the advance of human rights are not ensured for posterity. And that, you know, seeing on the processes that politics have been taking in the United States should give us a lot of lessons here in Mexico on how to advance on these topics. We cannot just... Um, think that because we've had this advance of the past five years, we, they'll, they'll, they'll be there forever. No? We have to have this perspective on how to defend what we've been conquering and how to face uh, hate speech and misinformation. Because at the end, most of what we're seeing uh, from conservative politicians in the US, it's, it's, it's misinformation uh, taking into public policy, and that's something that's very dangerous. So I'll just i open the mic for questions. You're really good. Thank you. He's good. <laughs> so if you have a question, we're really interested in getting more information from here more than your opinion. So I'll bring the mic around. If you can hold the mic and then you can stand up and hold the mic. <laughs> is, is there a central source of information in Guadalajara for the gay community at all? I have found it very difficult to find information even about the gay, the world games, as well as um, as well as the um, uh, other things or the prime events that were going on. There's there's no such thing as one central. But I'm happy to tell you that we're working on one. There's, you know, Madrid has a program that's uh, it's called El Programa Madrileño de Información LGBT. So it's like Madrid's LGBT Information Program. So we've been talking to them to understand how this works, and we've been working with the, the municipality of Guadalajara because they're they're looking to finance this to create one program. Like for of unified information, because it's also important to have, you know, a reference when where you know the information is is valid. So at the moment it doesn't exist. Uh, what I would say, like, you want to be aware of what's happening. You can uh, find us in social media as Sexual Diversity uh, Jalisco, Diversidad Sexual Jalisco. Those are the the official uh, accounts of our office. And, and most of the information, like the statistics I was telling you, they're all like in the pages of the institution that have, that have created them. So it's all everywhere, all around the place. So we, we, we are trying to work on, on this uh, information program where, where you could have all the resources all together. Like if you want to learn more, if you are a teacher where you can have activities or and for example, during Pride Month, we do have a calendar of activities within the Ministry of Culture's uh, website. So if you go to the Cultura Jalisco uh, website, you would find a program of, of activities for Pride Month. But that's something that's just during June each year. No, we are we're seeking to, towards the end of the administration, have this website with all the information in one place. So not yet, but we hope soon. Hi, how are you? My name is uh, Gustavo. Thank you for your presentation. This is really great. Um, I live in Guadalajara, very emotional. In the 80s, I was part of the persecution. My question to you today is, what is Jalisco doing today? 
in pattern legislation for future generations, not just what's happening now, I mean for future generations. Uh, I know you're working on this uh, kind of um, enactments of new laws and protections and everything. Is there anything further in the books, really, to enhance that? I'll describe totally your name of how great it is in terms of protection. And I have witnessed of that because I have a lot of friends who were part of that in the age when I lived about that. And I just want to know that. You know, thank you. No, thank you. Thank you very much for, for sharing. Um, as I was saying, you know, there's this part of legislation, you know, not now that the fact or something that I always said uh, when 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 I was defending the the legal right for trans kids to identity, one of the main arguments is we want a new generation of trans population to be able to grow without being marked by discrimination. And you know, we see, for example, in the in the UK right now, they're starting to have uh, LGBT history within the school books. And I said, like, okay, I would like to promote that legislation, but how? How can we talk of having LGBT history on the school books if we don't have our LGBT history written? So that's why we did the, fir the first exercise on the museum, and, we're, and we've been like, so it, it goes in different ways. Legislation, we've been working, um, as I was saying, with the with the um, kids, uh, legal right to identity. These things in school. In the past two years, I've been very focused on working. Um, to prevent bullying in schools, to prevent uh, youth LGBT suicide, which is a big uh, issue. Um, so this protocol we're having for school goes towards that. But another initiative, and Alba, which is here with the cell phone, she's the promoter of, an, uh, of a very beautiful initiative. On January of this year, and that's the, the thing I'm gonna say, it's not something, it's not a project that came from the, the institution, but it's, at the end, we're also part of the community. So um, we, you know, in the in the law of Jalisco, there's a mechanism for civil participation that's called like civil initiatives. So if you gather a certain numbers numbers of signature, you have the right to have your proposal being uh, being discuted uh, discuted by the authorities. So in January, Alba, me, and another group of friends went out to uh, take signatures to name a place within the Revolution Park, the, the square of diversity. And uh, we want, we want the, the, the municipality of Guadalajara to officially name this place, the square of diversity, and to install as a public sculptor that talks about the, the history of, of LGBT population. And the sculptor that we're promoting to install, it's the door of El Monica's. I don't know if you went to Monica's bar uh, in the 80s. The first openly gay bar in Guadalajara was called Monica's. It opened in 1980. And when it opened, it had to be disguised as a, as a table dance. Because, you know, uh, prostitution was legal, but homosexuality was illegal. So, uh, for the first years of this, of this bar, it would, it, it would have the facade as, like, as, as a gordo. But at the end, you know, there were men dancing and kissing each other. And it, it kept growing, kept growing, kept growing. And back in the 90s, it was, a, it was a club where you would find 200, 2,500 people per night. So it became a very important place for the, for the Mexican culture as well. Because, you know, back in the 80s and in the 90s, our, our, before, the, 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 before NAFTA, we, we, also, we had, Mexico had a lot of regulations, even for music. You couldn't play music in the Mexican radio that wasn't 10 years old in the United States. So, uh, that, that happened like in the 80s and in the 90s. So, you couldn't play music in the radio that was uh, less than 10 years old outside Mexico, for example. You, you know, when MTV appeared in the United States, that couldn't be on Mexican television. So people would go to the United States and they would record on cassettes what you would see on MTV and then you would bring it here. So the owner of this bar, he would drive to uh, Los Angeles and he would, he's, he's, this is something he tells us, no? he would take a lot of bottles of tequila and a lot of like charro um, shirts and he would uh, give that to the DJs on the LA gay bars 
he would give them tequila, he would give them charro suits, and they would give him, you know, the 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 videos of what was new at the moment, Donna Summer, everything. So he then he would, you know, see the show, the drag show in these bars in LA, and then he would come back and he would put the music to his friends and he would say, like, you know, in this act the drag would do this or would do that, or she was wearing this, like Donna Summer, and they would recreate everything they would see on the LA bars. So, you know, even the straight community, they would go to Monica, like, everyone would say, like, oh, Efrain's back from LA this weekend, and everyone would go to Monica's that weekend to hear, like, what was new on the United States, because at the moment it wasn't uh, open here. So that's why it became, like, a very um, beloved place by the community, and it closed in 2017, and when the bar closed, he sold the property, but he told the owner, the new owner already, if you tear the property down, I want to I wanna, I wanna keep the door. Because the door was made specifically for the bar. And he told me this, and I told him, I bought one. And they recently teared the place, so he told me, like, ah, I'm going to go and pick up the door of the bar. And I was like, and what are you going to do with that? And he's like, I'm not sure yet. Well, why you don't uh, give it so we can install it in this square? So we, we gathered almost 2,000 2, signatures. The law requires 615 signatures. We presented more than 2,000 signatures in January. And just the last week, the, the authorities uh, validated that we, um, we required all the legal requirements for this public initiative. And it's the first time, it's this legislation is recently, and it's the first civil initiative in this history of Guadalajara and it's for a place for LGBT member. And I believe that's something that's something important for new generations because if you like if, if at home your parents they don't acknowledge your sexual orientation or your gender identity but on the streets your city does you feel that you belong and it's important to have these public spaces after our history, not only in honor of those who were back, but in favor of those who are coming. You know? So they, when they go out on the streets, they know when they grow up, they can live in this city free. You were mentioning, let me add to that, you were mentioning about the music I was being, I was in LA, the day they opened, the first time they opened And I opened the box and I said, what is this? This is the greatest, it just came out four weeks ago, and blah, blah, blah. And the next day I flew down to Guadalajara <laughs> with the album, brand new, and I gave it to the guy for money. Wow, wow. <laughs> and you made a lot of gay dance, I'm sure. <laughs> I know you have a bunch of questions, but our time is short. I think I have to stop. I'm so sorry. Or if, if, if you, if a lot of people question, and I'll do just one answer at the end. You what? Like if we, I, we listen to two or three questions, yeah. and I answer them all okay. together. Okay. Mine is not a question. Thank you. This was outstandingly excellent uh, for, uh, for people who are trans, for people who are in that organization, and people who are not. I would appreciate more if you would go through and identify CIS, transgender, lesbian, queer, as a vocabulary so that those people who do not know will know. Okay, well. Invite me for another Sunday and I'll go through the vocabulary for sure. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you once again how your position was uh, started and how you got the position, you volunteered or were chosen, and if you have a paid staff or if you're paid yourself. And there's any last question and I'll answer all of them together. Oh, you want to know about the Catholic Church? What do you want to know about the Catholic Church? Do they get okay. in your way or help? 
no, Mexico is 90 percent Catholic, and I was wondering where the Catholic Church is on this issue, and where is the federal government on this issue? Because many states in Mexico, I think this is not. I mean, Jalisco is on the leading edge, but not all states are there. Thank you. Okay, so I'll, they're actually kind of together. Well, you know, there was a moment um, when, for example. Uh, the governor that was in Jalisco from 2006 to 2012, he was one of the most homophobic governors we had. He even said equal marriage was disgusting to him in a public speech. And uh, it was discovered that the government of Jalisco would finance, finance conversion therapy with public money. And the, the, this was a time where the governor was very close to the bishop. And it was a bishop who was profoundly homophobic. That bishop changed in 2013, the government changed in 2013, and the relations have changed. Right now, the most, like the bishop, I wouldn't say he's as homophobic as the ones we had uh, back in the day. And I think also within the, uh, the, the uh, Catholic religion, these issues are being discussed. Because you know, I'll just put an example. You know the Virgin of Zapopan, which is like the most famous virgin of the state, and she goes um, six months of the year, she's traveling around the whole city. Well, she's dressed every day by a homosexual. You know? <laughs> Gays, lesbians, we all participate in our communities. And if our communities are Catholic communities, like many of the Mexican traditions are Catholic traditions, and we're not a part of it. No? So that makes that also within the, the Catholic community there starts to be a more comprehensive discussion uh, on whether these topics should be approved or not. I think that you know the, the Pope, the Pope Francis, he's been you know changing a little bit the discourse and that moderates uh, certain things. Recently, for example, the, it's there's still a group within the, the religion that's very. Uh, fundamentalist and it's very like against uh, the rights but there's other group of Catholics that are you know having counter narratives on that for example recently you know the the, the church it has a newspaper that's that's published each Sunday in Jalisco it's called Semanario de la Arquidiócesis and you know I received on a, on a media report everything that's on the media talking about LGBT rights even if it's pro or against and one Sunday I received on this uh, report a re an article from the, from, the art, uh, from the church newspaper. The last time that had happened, it was an article of them saying, you know, bad things about me because of the kids, the trans kid legislation. But that was very few. It wasn't very, uh, like it wasn't very widespread. But this article I received like six months ago, it's a two-page article on their newspaper talking about transgender uh, issues on a very affirmative way. So for me, it's like a surprise, you know? They're even talking about trans kids. They're, you know, like it was an article written by a psychologist who was, it was a very good article. And for me, it was like a, a surprise. So, you know, like I put it on Twitter, like, hey, I found this article today on the, on the church newspaper, and this like uh, gives us a sense that it is possible to have a more responsible conversation. Well, that went viral on Twitter, and on Twitter, and there were people from the church that were the, that there were people. There were friends of the of the last bishop who was very homophobic that started to question how the actual bishop uh, let this happen on their newspaper, you know? And they they went and they asked for you know the right to to replica and whatever. And at the, the next week, or the next couple of weeks, they published uh, a misinformation article about trans people. No, but what the bishop said, uh, okay, if there's this information, you want to put this other, it, I, I don't believe it's the, way, the right way to do it, but this tells us they're facing this conversation within their own community. And I think that's, that's, that's how it's going to uh, go uh, eventually. Right now, uh, and going to the, to the, to the other uh, question, the actual governor, Enrique Alfaro, he, he's always presented himself as a center-left or a social democrat, 
and since he's the first time he ran for governor in 2012 and then he did it in 2018 he always uh, he has always had an affirmative on, on LGBT issues so it has made that our like LGBT rights are not a topic of power within the church so he, he's always declared that he's won elections uh, with that being out so that has like measured the the interference of these power structures within the state government. He he was major in 2007, 2015. He was major of Guadalajara, and he ensured equal marriage way before Congress. The, so it's been it's been a process. And so you know he ran for office in 20, in 2012, uh, the the actual governor of Jalisco, and that was you know the the, the 2012 elections in Jalisco where the elections were where it was clear for everyone that the Conservative Party was going out. The question is who, who was going in. So we had Aristoteles, the last governor, running with Alfaro, the actual governor, in 2012. And that was a very close campaign. Even though Alfaro started the campaign way uh, behind, during the campaign, he almost won to Aristoteles. So when Aristoteles was elected governor, he didn't have a, a wide majority, because uh, the majority of votes in, well, in Guadalajara's metropolitan area were for the other candidate, Alfaro. So that made that Aristoteles was a governor who had to make politics, because he didn't have a, a wide majority of votes. And that politic, well, the politics that we saw from 2012 to 2018, was like a race towards progressism. You know, you would, you would see Alfaro as a major say, I'm ensuring equal marriage, and then you would see Aristoteles say, I'm gonna le um, legalize uh, marijuana. So the the political context, in a way, started to change with this competition in these two visible actors. And for example, in 2017, Aristoteles, as a governor of Jalisco, was the first governor in the whole country to go to a primary. So you know, from 2015 to 2017, the two most visible politicians in the state, who was the governor and the mayor of Guadalajara, they were already, both of them, open about their LGBT support. So that made that in the election of 2018, it was clear that, it, or it wasn't clear, but it was very possible that, Al that Alfaro was gonna win the election. He had like a, a lot of um, uh, good numbers for the 2018 election. So he made a campaign that was more focused on uh, establishing tables with different uh, sectors of society to start to like design, uh, a plan of government, and in those tables, the LGBT activists um, asked for the sexual diversity directly. So he committed himself during the campaign to have this office, but at the end of the day, saying sexual diversity direction is something that's very abstract. You no, know, everyone can imagine something different when we talk about an office of this nature. So um, when he got elected, and he had already this compromise of having this this office. Uh, they started seeking for someone that had more of a technical profile, uh, not necessarily a political profile within like this uh, wide scope of organizations, and uh, that's how I got invited. I, I, I was working at the moment with a lesbian congresswoman in Mexico City, uh, so I was kind of visible working, like being the, the counselor for this lesbian congresswoman that was elected in 2018. So they, actually what happened is like a friend of mine that was working in the transition government said like, hey, do you know someone you could recommend? And I kind of joking said like, me? And she was like, oh really? Like, you would, you would, you would quit your job and, and come? And I was like, well, tell me about it. And they were, they were seeing other profiles. I came to an interview and I got invited. So I do have um, a public salary. I'm a public servant. And I do have a team that's also paid by the government. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm not going to be back. I have students here, so I'm going to be back. But right now, Miss Diana has a little gift for you. Yeah. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Andres, for being here. Thank you, everybody, to come. And we're going to have the video on YouTube, and we need to promote with everybody. So, and now he said he will come another day, so if you want to keep back and learn more about this, please uh, push him 
ask him. So we can have him again. So we have this little thing for you. And thank you so much for coming and sharing this information.